Hi, and welcome back to another video with Artist Right. So in this video, we're gonna take a little bit of a different approach. We're gonna answer some of the most common questions that you guys have asked me in the comment section of our videos and also when I meet you guys at different photography trade shows and conventions. But before we do that, I'd like to give you a brief update on our channel. We have just surpassed our first 100 subscriber. That means I can now have a YouTube handler on my channel, which is really kind of cool. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Artist Right. So you can check out that handle next time you need to see me. But anyway, our next goal is to reach 1,000 subscribers. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all of you who have, who have subscribed to my channels. Thank you so much for doing so. Now, what I'd like to do, if you haven't subscribed yet, please like, please share, and please subscribe to my channel. This way you'll be updated on all these cool educational content and color management videos that are upcoming. Okay, so moving right along. We're going to talk about the 10 most common asked questions that I get from people at different trade shows. So let's go into it. First off, the FTDI driver error with Palette Master Element. The easiest solution when you have that error come up is to plug in a USB cable, the one that comes with your BenQ display, between your laptop or your computer to the BenQ display. That will solve the FTDI driver issue. The reason why that driver issue or that thing pops up is because the display cable that you're using, for example, the HDMI, the display port cable, or any other cables that you may use is only carrying the display signal. It does not carry enough information for a palette master element to talk with the computer inside the display. And that's part of the reason why that error is occurring. So once you plug that in, you should be good. Now, as a rule of thumb, if you're using a Mac laptop that was manufactured before year 2000, 2015 or 2015, you will probably need to use a USB cable. If you're using a Mac laptop that was made after year 2016 or any Mac laptop with a USB type C, the oval shaped connector that you can plug in any direction, that one you only need to use one cable provided that you are using the two newer models behind me of the BenQ SW series, which is the SW271, the 4K panel, and the SW270C, the brand new 2K panel. Now, if you are using any of the other SW, the older ones, you would still need to use a USB cable even though you're using a USB Type-C. So I hope that clarifies it up. Now, if you're using a PC, the safest thing to do is to plug in a USB cable. That's just pretty much the rule of thumb right there. So I hope that this helps a lot of people out there who are running the FTDI driver error. Now you can also check out my calibration video as well that goes over how to do that and we'll talk about the FTDI driver error and how to reset the display too. Okay, so moving on to question number two. One of the questions I get is, will the BenQ SW271 4K display power a Apple MacBook Air? Because it does have a USB Type-C, but the power delivery on that display, the 4K one, is only 10 watts. So the best way to do it is to get a MacBook Air and test it out. And in my testing, I found out that it will not power up a MacBook Air. That one USB Type-C cable will still carry the display signal and all the I.O. signals. This way, you don't have to plug in an extra USB cable between the laptop and the display. However, you will still need to use your power brick if you're running a MacBook Air on the SW271 4K display. Now, it's a different story on the SW270C because that one has 60 watt power delivery. It will also power this one and including my larger 15 inch MacBook Pro as well. So something to consider on that note. So the next question that I get from a lot of photographers is that you have now purchased a BenQ SW series of hardware calibrated display. And I hear comments and feedback of people using the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer software. For example, if you're using an i1 device, you would be using the i1 profiler to do the profiling on the display. Or if you're using a spider software, you would be using the spider software to do the profiling of the display. Now, what I like to tell you is that you shouldn't be using that. What you need to use is Palette Master Element, and here's why. Because when you use Palette Master Element, what happened is that Palette Master Element will not only generate an ICC profile in a very similar fashion to the other OEM software, but what Palette Master Element does in addition to that is that it will also talk with the built-in computer, the built-in lookup table in the display to do the color adjustment at the panel level. This way you're doing a true hardware calibration and not just a software calibration through the ICC profile. Now, if you'd like to know more about how to calibrate these, I will put a link in the description in the video below. At a recent photography trade show that I went to, helping Ben Q out at their booth, I found out that photographers come up to me and ask, can I hook up an iMac to a Ben Q display? 
And the answer to that question is yes. The best way to think of the iMac that you have is just a very large laptop and you can hook up any external display to it. In fact, you should hook up a secondary BenQ display to it. This way you're editing on a truly color accurate hardware calibrated display. And this way you can set the BenQ as a primary display and then the internal iMac display as a secondary display. Now, depending on the iMac you got, you may have the iMac with a newer USB Type-C. You can just run one cable to the BenQ. If not, you would have to probably use a display, mini display port to display port cable and run an extra USB cable to avoid the FTDI driver issue. So I hope this helps out for those people who own an iMac and I hope that you actually look into running a BenQ as a secondary display. And I'll tell you this much, once you go second display, once you start working a second display, you'll never go back. So I met a lot of photographers who recently purchased the BenQ SFU series of hardware calibrated display and they're trying to calibrate the display with Palette Master Element. However, they're having a hard time trying to get Palette Master Element to launch and it has nothing to do with FTDI driver error. So what's going on? Many times when this happens, I found out that there are some programs that are preventing the Palette Master Element from working properly. So for instance, if you have the Color Monkey tray running in the background, if you have the i1 Profiler running in the background, or if you have the Spider software running in the background, many times these software sets itself so that it will boot up with your system. One of the easy ways to solve this problem is to remove these programs from the startup of your system. However, if you are done with these programs and you don't want to use these programs anymore, what you can also do is do an uninstall on them. And for a Windows PC, it's very easy. Just go to add and remove program, it will uninstall everything. For a Mac user, it's a little bit more difficult because there's really no uninstaller with some of these programs. So when you run into that problem, when there's no uninstaller, what you want to use is a program called App Cleaner. It's a free program, just download that, literally copy to the application folder, launch the program, the App Cleaner, and drag Color Monkey, whatever program you want to remove into the dialog box of the program, and it will search all the relevant files that are stored all across the user library on the Macintosh system. You click the lead and now that program is gone. So hopefully this helps out for those of you who are having problems trying to calibrate a Palette Master element and the SW series display who have had other devices installed before. One of the frequent questions I get from photographers is this. I primarily do editing for the web with occasional printing. Should I still calibrate my display to the largest color space possible? And my answer to that question is yes. And the reason why you want to do that is because anytime you edit your photos, you always want to edit for the future, not today, not for what you're about to post in the next 20 minutes or in the next hour, but you always want to edit for the future. Then the reason why I'm saying is because technologies are constantly improving. So in the future, when there are displays that can display a deeper color depth, more colors, for instance, you want to make sure that the photo that you're editing today will, will look great in the future too. And that's the part of reason why you want to calibrate your display to the largest color space possible. Now the other thing with the BenQ SEU series, if you have one, is that it comes with a hockey puck. And a hockey puck makes changing and proofing in different color space instantaneous. Just pre-program the button, press that customized hotkey, go to the color space you want to see what your picture will look like in. After you're done, switch back and do the editing in the largest color space possible. So again, we got to think about the future when we're editing our photos and we never know where our photo is going to be. Who knows, maybe Apple will contact you and ask you for your photos. That way you definitely want to use the largest color space possible. The next thing I want to talk about here is contrast ratio. I got this question in one of the comments of our video saying that there are people that have done testing on the BenQ SW series of display after calibration and the contrast ratio is 500 to 1, 600 to 1 or something like that. What happens is that as photographers, you need to remember that we're only setting our display brightness to about 100 nits or 100 candela. When we do that, the brightest is going to be at 100 and the darkest, because these are LCD screens, they cannot go as dark as, for example, like an OLED, for instance. So what happens is that the contrast ratio is obviously going to drop. It doesn't mean you're going to be editing a worse picture or that means your picture is not going to look as contrasty. It's just that you're not running the display at full brightness and rightly so you shouldn't be doing that. Otherwise your print will come out really dark when everything looks great on the display. So I hope that this helps clarify something out. Now here's the case. 
what it comes down to at the end of the day, I wouldn't worry so much about contrast ratio. As long as when you're visually viewing your screen, if it doesn't look flat beyond comprehension, I think your display calibration works great and is good. The other thing too is that once you are done with the display calibration, just make sure that you run a validation and make sure that that value, the delta E, is under two. Otherwise, you should be good. I wouldn't worry so much about specs or the contrast ratio in this case. Now, the next question I also get that's somewhat related to this as well is that, is BenQ panel an 8-bit plus FRC or a 10-bit panel? Now, this is getting a little bit into the geeky realm of the whole thing here, but here's the case. What is an 8-bit panel? Majority of the panels that are out there, the LCD panels, are 8-bit plus FRC. FRC is the technology that what happened is that it takes those 8-bit tones and it does kind of like the in-between tones. This is explaining it in super layman terms. But essentially those in-between tones kind of tricks your eyes into believing that the display is producing a 10-bit color. Now there are panels that run native 10-bit. BenQ have actually made panels in the SW series that run native 10 bits as well. But after a lot of extensive testing that they have done, they didn't see that much of a difference. And I have used both the 8-bit plus FRC and the 10-bit panel. And there is not that big of a difference. In fact, if I have two display behind a black cloth that doesn't show the model number side by side in the same size, rarely would people be able to tell them apart. So again, with the same tone as the other question, don't worry too much about the spec and just create great photos. Edit great photos, okay? So just go out there and make the best work possible with the display that you have. And I'll be honest with you, I use these BenQ with 8-bit plus FRC all the time and it's not been an issue. The next question I get here is a little bit more relevant to all of us and how do I clean my BenQ SW screen? That's a really great question because we now use our screen in a lot of environments. Like even if we're just using it in the studio, we get dust on it. So to get rid of dust, one of the easiest things I found out is you can use a soft cloth for that matter. But one thing that works really well is a Swiffer duster. Now, if you live in a country without Swiffer duster, a soft cloth will do, but you know, here we have Swiffer duster. It is so cool. You just swipe it across. It doesn't leave any residue of the dust. It works really great. Now, what happens though, if you have more stubborn like dots on the screen, let's say that you just, you're, ha you're enjoying the soda and you set up the soda glass or whatever the can that may be right next to the screen as you're editing. We all drink next to our screen sometimes. And by that, I only mean soft drink and water. But anyway, we all drink next to our screen every now and then. And sometimes there are minor splashes that comes up and those can be an annoying thing. I mean, you could be editing and think that that is a sensor dust. But when you start moving your picture around, the sensor dust stays, you know, it just stays in the same place on the screen, right? So in order to clean that, the best way that I found out is not to use a chemical cleaner, number one. But what I do is I actually take a really soft paper towel, just dampen it in like water, just very lightly and just run it over those spots. And then now afterwards, like, you know, it probably leaves some water streak. Afterwards, what I would do is use a microfiber cloth to run it over again. You can put a little bit of pressure on it this time and it will clean the screen up really nicely. So I found that that techniques work really well and you're only using water in this case, you're not using any chemical solution that will damage the coating on the BenQ display, okay? So here's the final point after hearing all your comments and questions, I hope that they actually answer most of your questions that you have. Don't worry too much about the specs, calibrate your display, use the proper software to do so, and just go out there and create good work. The specs is only part of the equation. It's what you see through the camera that will make the best work possible. And I know that you guys can do it without the need of all these specs to worry you every single day. So go out there and make good work. Now, one last point to wrap up here is that we have a lot of great and more color management videos planned for our channel. This is gonna be awesome. So recently x Rite has released a few new devices and when we get them into our studio we will do unboxing we will do a testing and we'll do a deep dive on them including videos and guides and tutorials on which one you should buy but to give you a brief idea recently they have just released the i1 photo pro 3 plus and that is a color spectrophotometer that is, that is designed to both calibrate displays projector and also profile prints 
Now the other two devices is the i1 Display Pro Plus. This is built on the successful i1 Display Pro, which is a device that I think is the best colorimeter out there. But this device, the i1 Display Pro Plus, can calibrate screens that can run as bright as 2000 nits. So these are more for reference displays. So for instance, if you're a videographer or a cinematographer, you're editing on these really bright reference display, this is a device that you may want to be looking at. Now the last device that they have introduced is the i1 Display Studio. The i1 Display Studio is meant to be used with the i1 Studio software. Now this, one, this device is really designed more for emerging professionals or anyone who actually want good color but doesn't need necessarily all the pro features. Once we get them into our studio, we'll do unboxing, we'll do a testing, and we'll actually do a guide on which one you should get. I hope that you find this video helpful. If you haven't done so already, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit on the notification bell so that you'll be updated every time I upload cool contents like this. And until next time, art is right.